Okay, we're now going to look at a classic article by Bertrand Russell, perhaps the most important, certainly the most important British philosopher of the early 20th century, um, and one of the founders of analytic philosophy. In this article from 1905, uh, he gives his theory of descriptions, uh, specifically definite descriptions. And this theory of descriptions is regarded as a classic piece of analytic philosophy in that it very cleverly appears to find a solution for problems that are plaguing uh, a particular project. Now, what is the project that is plagued by the problems that need solving? It is the project of, um, well, one element of it, one key element of it is the denotative theory of meaning. Now, um, philosophy of language, one of the key topics of philosophy of language is, of course, meaning. What is it for language to mean something? How is it that sentences or words mean things? And the most intuitive idea, the most attractive, really, idea, uh, is that language, bits of language, mean things by connecting in some way with the real world. Uh, we, we want to say that sentences can be true. And how can sentences be true? By correctly representing the world. So there is this link between words and the world. And the denotative theory of meaning is like this idea at its simplest. So that elements uh, of language mean what they do by denoting or picking out parts of the world. Now, of course, uh, this doesn't work for all parts of language, as we've said. There are all, all sorts of parts of language that don't pick out things in the world, like conjunctions, like uh, the word and doesn't pick anything out in the world. But this theory does seem to uh, make sense of names, um, proper names. So, for example, Simon Cushing is a piece of language that picks me out. It's uh, uh, the me if, insofar as the name Simon Cushing has meaning, can be understood, it, the meaning appears to be me. Okay. Now, um, for that theory, though, uh, there are a number of difficulties. For example, um, there is the difficulty that uh, names can be used that we understand that don't seem to pick anything out in the world. So, for example, um, King Kong or Frodo or, you know, Sherlock Holmes or Santa Claus. These are all names that we understand, we get them, but there isn't anything that corresponds to them in the world. So this is an immediate uh, issue for this approach to meaning. Now, um, a couple of uh, slightly earlier than Russell, but they're contemporaries in that they're still alive and they, uh, Russell um, had correspondences with both of them. Um, a couple of earlier philosophers than Russell, Meinong, and our friend Gottlob Frege, both had attempted responses to this problem. They said that words that are, uh, I mean, words or phrases that act as the subject of sentences, as names do, but also as things like definite descriptions are, and we'll get into that in a little bit, um, these things that appear to have their meaning by referring to something in the world, um, in cases where we would say that there isn't anything for them to refer to, Meinong said, well, there is really, just not in this world. So Meinong suggested that 
Uh, we're going to stick to this principle that uh, the subjects of sentences have meaning by picking out something real, by coming up with this notion, by expanding our notion of what's real. It isn't just chairs and tables and the furniture of the world that we're familiar with. It's also uh, a sort of expanded universe of shadowy existing things that exist because we can refer to them. So Meinong suggested that even such things, so, so first of all, things like unicorns exist because, you know, uh, we, a unicorn has a horn is a meaningful uh, sentence. And in fact, we would say that it is true. Well, Meinong said, the only way that we can make sense of it being true is if there really are unicorns for that sentence to pick out. Now, we know that there aren't unicorns in, in the physical world, so they have this kind of ethereal extra existence. Now, we've already seen Frege uh, has said that about propositions, um, that they have a kind of existence, and numbers. But uh, so sometimes to make sense of the world, you have to expand your ontology. That is, ontology means the things that you think exist beyond, uh, you know, the physical world. But people like Russell, and after him most famously uh, the American philosopher uh, Quine, want to keep the ontology to a bare minimum. They, want, they are uh, committed to Occam's razor, um, that is, don't believe in the existence of things unless it's absolutely necessary to explain the world. Uh, and this actually, this principle was apply, has been applied in science successfully. So for example, in the early days of the electron, most people didn't really believe it existed because uh, the only, uh, it was only um, proposed because uh, a theory that said that electrons existed seemed to have some good predictive powers. It was only when that theory was confirmed and uh, repeatedly and more added to it that finally most scientists believed in electrons because, of course, they couldn't be detected in the early days. We're going through a similar thing right now with dark matter. Apparently, like over 90% of the universe is made of this stuff that we cannot detect. So why believe in it? Well, because uh, the theories that explain the behavior of the universe have to rely on its existence. So that's why we should believe in it. Well, Meinong says, okay, our theory of language requires the existence of unicorns and even, even contradictory things like the round square. Meinong says we can make sense, we, we can say truthful things like the round square doesn't exist. That's a true sentence. For it to be a true sentence, the subject has to exist. So, in some sense, even the round square exists. Uh, Russell says, no, I'm sorry. The theory is screwed. If your theory, if for your theory to work, it has to say that all of these things exist um, in some weird sense of exist. That, that's just crossing a line. That means that your theory has to be abandoned or we have to find some way to solve that problem. We, we cannot that offends my vivid nature of reality, was the way Russell put it. Uh, it's too much. Uh, Quine later called it Meinong's ontological slum. That is, it's, it's overcrowded with things. You've got you to gotta clean that up. Frege had a different suggestion. Frege, um, Frege, as we've seen, draws this distinction between sense and reference. And he says, you can have uh, a sentence that has sense, uh, you can have a part of a sentence that has sense but not reference. So, for example, um, the present king of France, there isn't one, but if we say uh, the present king of France, we understand that state, uh, that, um, that is a definite description. A definite description, the, the definite refers to the definite article. If you're familiar with grammar, the, the, the kinds of articles are definite, which is the, and indefinite, which is a. Uh. Um, so definite descriptions are descriptions beginning with the definite article, like the king of France, or the bird on my head, or something like that. Um, 
So uh, Frege says we can, uh, phrases uh, like that can have sense without reference. Russell doesn't like that either. Um, because he says, first of all, he doesn't like the idea of senses because they require the existence of, of weird things. Uh, and, and also, it makes the, um, the theory of meaning much less uh, streamlined and commonsensical. Uh, the denotative theory of meaning is very down-to-earth and simple. And it, it would be better if we can preserve this idea of denotative theory meaning without adding this extra notion of senses as well as reference. Frege, how does Frege deal with cases like um, the king of France is bald, uh, where there isn't a king of France? He, uh, he says, well, either they do have references, these em empty terms, they do have reference as well as sense, and, but they all refer to something called the null set. That is, the set that, contain, that doesn't contain anything. The problem with this solution is that um, all things that don't exist refer to the same thing. So, for example, I don't have any daughters, but apparently my daughter is the same as, is, exact, is the present king of France right? Because both of them don't exist, so they both refer to the null set. So the null set is, both, is at the same time my daughter and the present king of France. So it, it seems like that would make this sentence true. My daughter is the king of France. That isn't true, so there's obviously a problem with that uh, solution. Um, the other possibility that Frege suggested is that such sentences as the present king of France is bald don't have a truth value because they don't refer. And Russell didn't like that either. He didn't like, he, uh, he was committed to bivalence. That is the idea that there are only two truth values and every meaningful proposition is either true or false. He didn't like gaps. He didn't like there being uh, meaningful statements that are neither true or false. This is also um, a problem if you think that meaning is is bound up very closely with truth. That yeah, if it doesn't have a truth value, it's in some sense can't have a meaning. And Russell is working on a, a project like that. So he doesn't like either of Frege's solutions. His criticism of Frege in the article on denoting is very hard to follow, um, but it's not that important. It's not the, uh, the most important part of the article. All right, so, um, there is a famous quote uh, in On Denoting that is often cited, and I will read it to you if I can find it. Yes, uh, on the version we've got, it's on page um, six. A logical theory may be tested by its capacity for dealing with puzzles. And it is a wholesome plan in thinking about logic to stock the mind with as many puzzles as possible, since these serve much the same purpose as is served by experiments in physical science. I shall therefore state three puzzles which a theory as to denoting ought to be able to solve, and I will show later that my theory solves them. Here are the three puzzles. Um, the first puzzle is to do with substitutivity. And um, we've actually, we've already seen one puzzle, but these are the puzzles that he discusses. George IV wanted to know whether uh, Scott, this is the uh, 19th century author, Sir Walter Scott, who was fabulously popular in the 19th century but, and at the beginning of the 20th century, but not so popular now. Anyway, Sir Walter Scott was the author of Waverley, which was his first famous novel. Um, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, according to uh, a denotative theory of meaning, if two uh, terms denote the same thing, then you should be able to replace one with the other without changing the meaning and also without changing the truth value of a statement. So, George IV wanted to know whether Scott was the author of Waverley. This is true, let's suppose. Well, but who is the author of Waverley? Who does the, this definite, this is a definite description. And 
assuming that definite descriptions denote things that pick things out, and that's how they have meaning, what is it that this picks out? And the answer is obviously Sir Walter Scott. So if, uh, according to the denotative theory of meaning, um, it should obey Leibniz's principle of intersubstitutivity salva veritate. That is, you should be able to take out uh, a term and replace it with a term that refers to the same thing without changing the meaning. We've already seen this discussed in Frege's article where he talks about Hesperus and Phosphorus, the morning star and the evening star. So Frege discusses the same puzzle too, but this is uh, uh, Russell's version of it. If you take out the author of, uh, author of Waverley and replace it with another term that has the same reference, Scott, then you get George IV wanted to know whether Scott was Scott. But that's not true. George IV did not want to know whether Scott was Scott. Nobody wants to know that. They just instinctively know that because nobody uh, wants to know that somebody is identical with themselves. They know that. So, in other words, this violates the principle of uh, intersubstitutivity salva veritate um, because uh, it's true to say George IV wanted to know whether Scott was the author of Waverley, but false to say George IV wanted to know whether Scott was Scott. So that's one puzzle. And the puzzle comes about by thinking of a definite description as having its meaning by picking something out in the world, the denotative theory. Now remember, Russell likes this theory. He likes this denotative theory of meaning. Uh, so the problem seems to be not with the, th well, he wants to save the theory, but the problem seems to be with the part of the theory that says definite descriptions have their meaning by denoting. So he's going to solve this problem by saying that actually, def this is his theory of descriptions, by saying that definite descriptions do not actually behave like names. Names uh, do have their meaning by picking something out in the world. Definite descriptions that grammatically behave like names don't in fact logically behave like names. So actually, this is perhaps the most important idea of Russell's theory of descriptions. And that is that the grammar of language is not necessarily the grammar of logic. So one of the projects that uh, Russell is engaged in is sort of creating this, uh, this thing, logic, uh, basically, his, his and Frege's contribution was predicate logic, uh, propositional logic, P's and Q's was already around before them, but they, they uh, brought in these apparatuses of predicates, like this one here. Um, uh, he believed that predicate logic could state things perfectly and unambiguously in a way that natural language couldn't. Natural language has great benefits. You know, you can write poetry in it, you can make puns in it. Uh, but if you want a language that totally and unambiguously uh, conveys facts about the world, logic is what you should use, or at least that's the idea that um, Russell is working with. So this, this big key is that the grammar, the, the, the grammar of, for example, English is not necessarily the same as the grammar of the logic that conveys the information of the English sentence. So in an English sentence, a definite description can be the subject of a sentence, and it can behave exactly like a, a name, which is why we think we should be able to take out uh, a definite description and replace it with a name, because they behave the same in English grammar. Russell's theory of description says, but they don't behave the same in logic. Uh, and we'll get into that in a second. All right, excluded middle. The law of excluded middle, um, things, uh, propositions have to either be true or not true. This is essentially bivalence. Uh, the trouble is, with when you're using definite descriptions that don't refer, it looks like you come up with, as, as Frege suggested, statements that are neither true nor false. So, the king of France is bald. Is that true? 
No, because there's no King of France. Oh, then the King of France is not bald. Well, no, because there's no King of France. So you, this statement appears to be neither true nor false. But according to bivalence, it's got to be one or the other. And even more important, its negation has to be the opposite. So the King of France is bald has to be either true or false. And then the King of France is not bald has to be the opposite. But as Russell points out, if you take a list of all the bald things and a list of all the things that are not bald, you can't find the King of France on either list because there is no King of France. France is a republic. OK, how do we solve that? Uh, and the third puzzle that needs solving is it seems to make perfect sense to say that um, Santa Claus does not exist. Uh, or the King of France does not exist. But notice what you're saying, why this doesn't seem to make sense, certainly in Meinong's theory, because Meinong says the subject of a sentence has to exist for the sentence to have truth value. But this is true. The King of France does not exist is true precisely because the King of France doesn't exist. Whereas Meinong seems to say, you have to have something that exists in order to say that it doesn't exist, which is a contradiction. So there's a problem. All right, how do we solve this? What is the theory of descriptions? Well, there's another video uh, done by a, um, a guy called Nathan Hawkins that uh, I want to give you a link to, where he does a very good job of laying it out. I will do a shorter and shoddier job. It helps if you know some logic. Um, because if you know some predicate logic, what you will, certainly if you take my logic class, you will have learnt that uh, there is a difference. This illustrates very nicely uh, Russell's point about the surface grammar being different from the logical grammar. Because these statements, the snake spoke to Eve and a snake spoke to Eve, seem to be almost exactly the same. But notice this is the definite article and this is the um, indefinite article. Now, I'm actually using here something that Russell would deny. But in the way that we teach logic, we teach the snake as a name. OK, if the snake is a name, then you present it like this. This is the predicate, which just means T for talk to, because I needed S for snake. So this, uh, this is a predicate meaning blank. It's a two-place predicate, meaning blank spoke to blank. And then the, the names that come after it fill in the blanks. So this name stands for the snake, and this name stands for Eve. So we have the snake spoke to Eve. No quantifiers. Now, if you're using the indefinite statement, a snake spoke to Eve, you cannot use a name, because a name has to speak, pick out a specific individual. So you have to use, and this is basically Russell's innovation, a, uh, this is called the existential quantifier. And the existential quantifier talks about variables, not names. And it says there exists at least one thing. And what can we say about that thing? It's a snake, and it talked to Eve. Notice how much simpler this is than this. Well, Russell's um, approach is to say that actually, Definite articles are just like in, uh, definite descriptions are just like indefinite descriptions in that you have to turn them into uh, variables that have predicates attached to them. But you have to do one more thing because the difference between a snake means it's just some snake. And it could be more than one. The way that this uh, quantifier works in logic is it means at least one. There is at least one snake and it talked to it. The difference between a snake and the snake, according to Russell then, is you've got to add that there can't be more than one. So you add a little bit on the end and you say, uh, and the little bit on the end uses the universal quantifier and it says for everything in the universe, if it is, if that thing which you use the variable y for, for all y's in the universe, if that thing is a snake, then it is x. In other words, uh, it's a way of saying 
there is nothing else that could be a snake that isn't this one thing. That captures the uniqueness of uh, the snake. So basically, what he does is he turns a definite description into a set of variables and quantifiers. And once you do that, it's no longer the subject of the sentence. Here it's clear that um, the subject of the sentence is the snake. Whereas if you treat it like this, the subject of the sentence is something. There exists something. It's not the snake, it's something. So, how does this solve the problem? Well, it means that the author of uh, Waverley doesn't have meaning by picking something out. So the, the core of Russell's solution is to say that actually definite descriptions do not pick something out in the world. So actually, uh, kind of ironically, he saves the denotative theory of reference that, that says that things, uh, you know, certain things have meaning by picking out th the denotative theory of meaning, by saying that uh, things have meaning by picking out something in the world, by denoting them. He saves it by radically diminishing the number of things that denote. Now, according to Russell, uh, Russell's mature view, the only thing, the only uh, parts of language that actually pick out things in the world are logically proper names. Now, in this article, he treats Scott as if it's a logically proper name. Later on, he's going to say that even grammatically proper names don't do that. And his mature view is that the only parts of language that actually do denote, pick something out in the world, are the words this and that. Those are the only logically proper names. These are grammatically proper names, but remember, grammar and logic are not the same. That's the key idea behind the theory of descriptions. So, um, the first way that that solves that is uh, you cannot replace Scott by the author of Waverley. Um, so, they are not, you cannot, you cannot substitute one for the other, so you don't get the problem of uh, taking that out and replacing it with Scott. They're not, they don't uh, refer to the same things. Okay, how do we deal with this? Well, uh, the way we should understand this is, instead of saying the King of France is bold, bold we say, there is an X who is the, uniquely the King of France, and that person is bald. Now, that statement is false because it may, includes an existential claim. It includes the claim that there is a king of France, and that's just not true. So we, uh, we have now made this statement have a truth value as opposed to Frege's solution, and it is false. Okay, but we've still got the problem of we need to come up with uh, some understanding of the king of France is not bold so that it's true because remember, if one of them is false, then its negation is, has to be true to save um, uh, bivalence. So we've already seen that we've given it a truth value. The King of France is bald is false because what it means is there exists something that is a King of France and is bald. And because there doesn't exist something that is the King of France, that's false. Okay. But what it seems like we're saying when we say the King of France is not bold, it seems like we're saying there is something who is uniquely King of France and is not bold. And that would be false as well. So it seems like we've still got the problem of uh, the negation of something false is something false, whereas we need to have the negation of something false be true. Well, here's the way that Russell solves it. He says, actually, the King of France is not bold is a piece of English language that is ambiguous, which again is not a problem that logic has. Now this isn't actually logic, but it's, it's a, a way of uh, sort of writing out English so that it maps onto the logical notation. Um, there are two ways to understand the King of France is bold, depending on what the not, uh, the King of France is not bold, depending on what the not is mo uh, modifying. He says the primary way to understand it is 
uh, this way. There, there is an X who is the king of France and X is not bald. And if we understand it that way, that is false as well because there isn't a king of France. But there is this other way of understanding it, which he calls the secondary way. And that's where the knot is out the front. So uh, uh, when you say the king of France is bald, you're saying it is not the case that there is, a something, there is something who is uniquely king of France and is bald. And that is true because it is true to say that is, there is not something that exists that is the king of France. That's true to say that there's, there's not something that exists. So now we've got a way to understand uh, the king of France is not bold as a true statement. So we already had a way to understand the king of France is bold as a false statement because it, it's falsely claiming that there exists a king of France. And now we have a way to understand the negation of it as a as the opposite, as a true statement, because it's saying it is not the case that there exists a king of France, which is true. So we've saved uh, the excluded middle. Negative existential, uh, sorry, existentials, not existentialism. Existentialism is, uh, of course, a movement that comes along mid 20th century and is uh, not, uh, not what Russell is talking about. Okay, uh, how do we say meaningfully that Santa Claus or the King of France doesn't exist? Well, you say um, there is an X who is uniquely the King of France and X exists. Uh, that is a false statement. Whereas uh, the King of France does not exist, again, we understand it in the secondary sense and we say it is not the case that there is something that is the king of, of France and that exists. That's a true statement. So that makes, if you understand, um, you understand this in what Russell calls the secondary sense. So the difference between the primary and the secondary sense is sort of the scope of the negation. Does the negation apply to the baldness uh, or, and that's if you're using, he calls this the primary sense because the king of France is sort of in the driving seat. Whereas here, the negation is in the driving seat and the, the, uh, prime, the uh, king of France, the definite description, is modified by the negation. So if we understand it in the secondary sense, it is true to say it is not the case that there is a king of France that exists. It's true to say that there isn't one because the king of France doesn't exist. So what has Russell done? Well. One of the most important things he's done is he's demonstrated how logic can paraphrase the information that we try to convey in natural language in unambiguous ways that avoid the puzzles that result uh, from using English in certain ways. So uh, the other thing that he's done is preserve simple, powerful ideas like the denotative theory of meaning. Now, you might say there's some cost to the denotative theory of meaning in what he's done in that now, eventually, Russell is led to say that there's only two things, uh, this and that, only two logically proper names that actually connect language to the world and all the rest of language is just related to each other. It's all syntax, the way that the rules of, uh, of the grammar of logic work. Um, so we've lost this powerful idea that language is meaningful by, or at least we diluted it a lot, that language is meaningful by connecting to the world, by sort of picking information about the world, uh, by sort of saying that definite descriptions don't really r act like names. Even though grammatically they act like names, grammatically, wherever you use a name, you can replace it with a description. But logically, at the fundamental level, they don't do what names do, which is pick things out in the world. And then later on, he says names don't even do that. Only logically proper names do that. So it might seem like Russell is fighting kind of a rearguard action um, to save the denotative theory of meaning by kind of diluting it. But there you go.